Thanks, Jeff, very much for that gracious introduction. I'm grateful to RJ and to Kelly for having me here tonight uh, to be with you and the Igor Institute. Um, I want to um, begin by uh, telling you that I, I think we should be careful um, not to be misled by the marital misadventures of the rich and famous, uh, people like Madonna, uh, Mel, and, and Mark. Uh, because what we're seeing now in our culture um, is that in the real world, um, in the real world, marriage is in trouble among folks who are in, um, certainly among the poor, but what we're calling middle Americans in some recent work that we've been doing uh, at the University of Virginia. Um, these are Americans who are high school educated um, and who, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago would have been kind of the, the heart of, um, you know, of, of marriage and of a strong marriage culture, but are now, as you'll see tonight, kind of becoming increasingly distanced um, from the institution of marriage and in ways that are deeply troubling. And so what we're seeing in this country is that we're growing increasingly separate and unequal um, when it comes to marriage. So that the, the powerful and the privileged um, Americans who are more affluent and who are college educated are doing com comparatively well. Um, both their less educated and less affluent fellow citizens, but also compared to the people who came before them in the 70s and 80s. Um, so there actually is some good news uh, to discuss tonight. But the, the problem and the challenge facing us as a country is that Americans um, who are less privileged, uh, less powerful, less educated, less affluent, are having more difficulty in um, participating and sustaining a strong marriage uh, culture. And as I move forward in my talk, and I want to be clear that, um, you know, kind of I'm talking really about three different groups um, that allow us to sort of think about um, sort of three different strata, if you will, in our society. I'm talking about highly educated Americans who've got college degrees and who tend to be uh, more affluent. I'm talking about high school educated Americans, middle Americans uh, for our purposes in this discussion tonight, um, who still make up a majority of the American adult population. For those of us who work in and around colleges, who have college degrees, it can be, I think, surprising to be reminded of the fact that most Americans don't have a college degree. They don't have a BA or a BS. Um, and this sort of vast middle group of Americans um, you know, still play an important role in our society. We need to think about how they're doing in a variety of means, including, I think, um, in marriage. And then we also are thinking about those who are the least educated, those who are high school dropouts and who would, uh, who would tend to be poor um, and are, are often poor in our, <clears throat> in our culture. So what we're seeing um, on a number of different indicators um, is that uh, this middle American group, this moderately educated group, this high school educated group is coming to resemble um, more and more um, their, their poor or their least educated peers uh, in the U.S. And if we begin with divorce, we can see that divorce actually has come up a little bit among this middle educated group uh, from the 70s uh, to the present. Um, we're looking here at divorce for the first 10 years um, of a marriage. Um, and you can see it's actually come down a little bit among those who are least educated, I think in part because um, fewer and fewer of them are getting married in the first place. So the types of people who are getting married in this group um, are more selective in a kind of a good way. What's also interesting here is you can see that um, Americans who are college educated have much um, lower uh, levels of divorce and their levels of divorce have obviously come down in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. So there's obviously a pretty big divide um, on the divorce uh, outcome. But I think even more dramatic and more disturbing is we're seeing um, when it comes to illegitimacy, having kids outside of marriage. Um, and back in the 80s, the early 80s, Americans who were high school educated looked a lot more like their college educated peers. Um, whereas today you can see in these red bars, uh, they look a lot more like their least educated peers. Um, so the point here simply is that Americans who have a high school degree, women now who have a high school degree and are having kids, um, are much more likely to be uh, following in the footsteps of their poorest and least educated uh, sisters than they are in their better educated um, and more affluent sisters, um, so to speak. And uh, this is just one more sort of picture of how we're kind of dividing um, along sort of class and educational lines when it comes to, uh, to marriage. And I think this is most consequential as we think about how these trends uh, bear on the welfare of children. 
And it's important that divorce is stratified. It's important that non-marital childbearing is, is stratified, particularly because these patterns bear on the, on the welfare and the well-being of kids. And what we see here, of course, is that kids who are coming from less educated homes are now less likely to be living with their mother um, and their father when they turn 14 uh, than our kids who are hailing from college educated homes. You can see actually that there's been a, a slight increase in stability in college educated homes. So they're kind of, they're navigating all the complexity in our society in some ways uh, better today than they were back in the 70s and 80s, at the height of, of the divorce revolution. For those Americans who are college educated, by contrast, kids in less educated contexts, in middle American contexts, and kind of poor contexts are having uh, more and more difficulty in being connected um, and being related in a fundamental day-to-day -day way with their, with their mother um, and especially, of course, their father. So what we found in this report that we released recently called When Marriage Disappears is that there's a retreat from marriage afoot um, in America, but what it's important for us to understand is that this retreat has kind of first begun among the poor and the least educated in our society and has now crept into this middle American category of high school um, educated Americans. So that their patterns um, of marriage, divorce, cohabitation are coming to resemble those that we found among the poor since the late 60s um, and 1970s. So why is this happening? Uh, you know, 50 years ago, there weren't marked differences by class um, in America when it came to married life. Um, you know, how is it that we are at a point in our nation's history where your education, uh, where your relative affluence is so closely connected to your marital status? And of course, on these kinds of issues and questions, liberals would tend to stress economic arguments. So people like William Julius Wilson, a sociologist at Harvard, um, has suggested that what's really driving this are shifts in the economy, shifts from an industrial economy um, to a service or information economy. Whereas conservatives would tend to stress the importance of cultural and, and legal and policy shifts um, that have in, uh, in various ways undercut the power of, of marriage as a legal and a cultural institution. And this kind of argument is expressed by Charles Murray in his recent book, Coming Apart, um, as well as in some follow-up articles that he wrote for the Wall Street Journal um, on this subject. So who's right here? Well, my view in looking at, at the data and thinking about this a good bit is that I think both uh, of these perspectives are right. Um, and in our, our report, what we find is that a changing culture, uh, a changing economy, and what's often, I think, overlooked, and I think is particularly relevant to our discussion tonight, and to indeed RJ's comments uh, tonight, is the retreat from civil society that we're seeing um, in our country. And I'll talk about that more uh, in a second. So first of all, on the, cultural, uh, on the cultural issues that are, I think, implicated in this uh, growing divide uh, between Americans who are college educated and those who are not. On the one hand, almost all Americans honor the ideal of marriage, um, kind of in theory. I mean, basically, there are very few Americans that are, who don't kind of aspire to a lifelong happy marriage. It's kind of a, there's almost a universal appeal to that that kind of ideal, and it doesn't vary much by race, by ethnicity, or by class. But as a society, of course, we're becoming increasingly tolerant of departures from that ideal in practice. Um, whether it's premarital sex, whether it's non-marital childbearing, whether it's divorce, you know, the issues go on and on. And what we're seeing in the data um, is that middle Americans are becoming increasingly tolerant of these departures um, from this um, ideal. And that, I think, is part of the reason that they are uh, themselves becoming more distant uh, from marriage. So in practical terms, middle Americans are now less likely to have what we call a marriage mindset that would guide their approach to things like sex and parenthood um, and a lifelong relationship with, uh, with someone in an intimate way. So more concretely, um, in looking at the general social survey, a, a key kind of national um, indicator for sociology and for other um, other sciences in the social sciences, what we see is that um, among Americans who are college educated, and this is one of the more surprising things that we found in the data, they become actually less um, supportive of divorce. They become more likely to embrace restrictive attitudes towards divorce from the 70s to the present. Um, 
by contrast, the least educated Americans have becoming, uh, become more accepting. There's been no shift among Americans uh, who are high school educated. So the point I'm making here is there's been a kind of shift among college educated folk to taking a more jaundiced view of divorce. I think that's probably, and that was surprising to me, I think probably might be surprising to some of you here uh, tonight. Whereas that um, more restrictive attitude towards divorce has become um, less uh, popular, particularly among the least educated Americans in our society. And then we see a similar pattern when it comes to, to premarital sex. Um, so uh, this is looking at people op um, opposing premarital sex. And what's surprising here is, that even though it's a, it's a minority, what's surprising here is that college-educated Americans have become more likely to oppose premarital sex from the 70s to the present, whereas clearly for both uh, high school-educated Americans, middle Americans, and for le the least educated group of Americans, um, they become more accommodating in their view of premarital sex. We also see a similar pattern when it comes to this issue of teen pregnancy. And we see is that uh, teenagers who hail from better educated homes are much more likely, this is true for both boys um, and girls, they're much more likely to report that they would be embarrassed by either bearing a child for girls or by fathering a child for teenage boys when they come from a highly educated home, when their mom has a college degree. By contrast, kids who come from high school educated homes or from homes where there's a high school dropout are uh, much less likely to report that they would be embarrassed by a teenage pregnancy. And the bigger point that I'm making here is that even though college educated Americans are actually more liberal on things like abortion and same-sex marriage, when it comes to kind of their direct approach to relationships and to uh, parenthood and family life more particularly, they're actually taking a much more conventional approach to kind of their own relationships and what they see and hope for for their kids. So kind of when it comes to their own lives um, and their own approach to family, they're much more likely to embrace a marriage mindset. Um, and unfortunately, Americans who are, who are less educated, as we can see tonight, are less likely now uh, a days to embrace that mindset. Okay, so I've talked briefly about some cultural shifts um, and the way in which college-educated Americans have, I think, become increasingly, um, if discreetly, <laughs> privately, appreciative of marriage um, in their own lives. We're also seeing some major shifts in institutions, in economic institutions and civic institutions, um, in ways that are, are uh, leaving middle Americans more disengaged uh, from these institutions of work and civil society, including religion. Um, and this is particularly true for working class, middle American, poor, poor men. And this is important because these institutions have traditionally supplied money, moral direction, and social support uh, to marriage and family life uh, in our country. So just to take the economic piece um, first here, what we are seeing in the economy is that middle Americans, particularly middle American men, have seen their economic fortunes uh, really especially middle American men, have seen their economic fortunes fall over the last 40 years since the 70s um, as evidenced by declines in real wages for high school educated men and by increasing spells of unemployment. This is not true uh, for, for college educated Americans. And now, the Great Recession makes the story a little bit more, more complicated, but this next slide gives you some sense of sort of the, the way in which um, the changing economy is having a, a disparate impact um, on men who have got a high school degree um, or men who are high school dropouts. So what you can see here is that as we go from um, the 70s in yellow to the 2000s in blue, that men who are less educated are much more likely to be experiencing spells of unemployment um, as the economy shifts in ways that are less likely to reward um, the kinds of skills and strengths um, that these men have historically brought to labor market, often in terms of industries like, for instance, construction um, and, and manufacturing. Now, this is important because even in our day, um, it's still the case that men who are gainfully employed in a stable job are much more likely uh, to get married and to stay married. And both, they're more attractive to the women in their lives, but I think they're also more likely to see themselves as marriageable men, and more likely to act in ways that would make them marriageable when they have access to a decent, stable job. So the fact that our economy has changed in ways that have made it more difficult for um, high school educated 
men and for men who don't have a high school degree, um, to get this kind of work is one reason that we're seeing um, this retreat for marriage um, concentrated among uh, couples who are, who are less educated. But it's also the case, too, that we have seen, as Robert Putnam um, argues in his book, Bowling Alone, a marked decline in the civic and religious fabric um, of this society. Um, what's interesting, though, is that Putnam is seemingly kind of unaware of the way in which this decline has been, has been concentrated um, in less uh, privileged precincts um, in our country. And the next two slides give you some sense of how it's played out, both in secular um, and in religious arenas. So on the secular front, if we look at membership in secular institutions, what we can see is that from the 70s, once again in yellow, to the 2000s in blue, that there has been a drop off across, you know, you know, across the society. But this drop off has been more consequential for Americans who don't have a college degree um, than it is for Americans uh, who do have a college degree. And when it comes to religions, I think some pretty striking patterns here. So back in the 70s, Americans who had a high school degree were more likely to be re uh, regular, regular churchgoers um, than their college-educated peers and their peers who were high school dropouts. By contrast, in our day and age, people who are college-educated are more likely to be found uh, in the pews on any given Sunday. Um, by contrast, their middle American uh, fellow citizens um, and, and folks who are high school dropouts are clearly much less likely to be um, attending church uh, on a regular basis. And this is important because my own work and the work of others suggests that religion um, is a powerful force for good um, in American families. The people who are exposed to the nomos, the norms and the networks found in religious institutions, by nomos I mean a kind of certain kind of worldview, a sense that the world is meaningful and has purpose. Um, a worldview that gives people the capacity to deal with suffering and difficulty um, in their lives and in their relationships. By norms, of course, I'm talking about things like being opposed to premarital sex or, or thinking that you know, marriage is for life um, and um, that uh, fidelity is important, um, that forgiveness is important. Um, and networks, of course, being embedded in communities where, where friends uh, and fellow congregants um, take your marriage seriously and um, give you support uh, when you need support, um, give you congratulations when things are going well in your family life, but also hold you accountable you know, when, when obstacles emerge in your, in your marriage um, or when you're tempted to do something that would, that would be harmful to your marriage. So for all these reasons, the fact that Americans who are less educated and less privileged are also less likely to be found in church on any given Sunday um, is, a, is, <laughs> is a bad thing in short for um, you know, for marriage um, in, our, in our country. So when we add all these things up, what we see is that middle Americans, particularly men, are less connected to institutions of work, civil society, and religion, um, institutions that have long sustained strong marriages in our culture. They're less likely to embrace what I call a marriage mindset um, that uh, tends to orient people to a lot of the, the behaviors that support marriage. And that all these factors taken together help to account for this growing marriage gap, this growing marriage divide between college-educated Americans and other Americans. So why should we care about this? You know, and frankly, in the academy uh, where I work and when I talk to journalists about these questions, you often get this view that the family is not in any way in decline. It's simply changing. You know, we have, we have new forms of family diversity that seem to spring up at every moment um, in our society. Um, and you know, fundamentally, when I think about this question, I think about you know, how, are, how are the kids being affected by all this? Um, I will say a word to you about adults too, but I want to just focus for the most part as we move towards the second half of my talk about how this is always playing out for, for kids. And I, was, I should say too, as just in terms of disclosure here, full disclosure, I was raised by a single mother, and I think both, uh, both me and my sister is actually few miles away from here in, in Media, Pennsylvania, have turned out pretty well um, in, in our own ways. We are happily married, lots of kids between us, and, um, you know, um, so I want to be clear here that being, being raised by a single parent, in my case by a single mother, is not, is not a death sentence, okay? But it is the case that, you know, we know 
uh, from a broader social scientific perspective that kids who are raised outside of intact married household are more likely to suffer in some way, shape, or another. And what it looks like on average is that kids who are, who are raised by their unmarried parents, about 10% of them will experience serious things like depression and delinquency as, as kids, compared to about 25 or 30% of kids in single parent households um, to take you know, one alternative family structure. So that's a pretty big difference when you think about how this plays out in schools in colleges, um, in churches, um, and oftentimes in neighborhoods in places like North Philadelphia. And just to go on that, on that kind of very theme, what we know is that, for instance, boys who are raised in a single parent home are about twice as likely to end up in jail or in prison. Now, it could be for one night of, of drunkenness, or it could be you know, a, a, a life sentence for, um, for second degree murder. Um, but the point is, is that boys who are raised at home without their father are less likely to get the discipline, the attention, um, and the modeling that a, that a good father can provide to them. And they are more likely to be um, lured um, by the sort of siren call of the streets um, um, or their delinquent peers. And that's what this, this kind of, of study from my mentor at Princeton, Sarah McClanahan, would, would suggest to us. But it's not the, it, it, or, but it's also the case that dads matter for daughters. And Bruce Ellis at the University of Arizona has looked at the association between when a father leaves the household and um, the odds that his daughter would become pregnant um, as a teenager, I think before the age of 16. And what he found in his work is that when dad sticks around for the entire duration of a girl's life, she's much less likely to become pregnant as a teenager. Uh, whereas if she leaves before she turns six, dramatically more likely to become uh, pregnant as a teen. Obviously also more likely to become pregnant as a teen if, if he leaves when she's a school, um, uh, school aged. So the point here simply is that having a father in the household um, to provide some affection, uh, to provide some attention, to model appropriate love between um, a woman and a man in the household seems to be enormously protective for, for girls. And in fact, a colleague of mine, Mark Regneris, who's at the University of Texas at, at Austin, um, did a different study looking at the impact of the quality of the relationship between a father um, and his daughter and a mother and her daughter. And what he found was that both a high quality maternal and high quality paternal relationship were more likely to lead to delayed sexual debut or, or no sex um, before marriage for girls. But it was the paternal relationship with the daughter that was the most um, predictive of a girl um, living and, and, and acting in, in a chaste way. So the point simply is that dads matter for, for sons um, and for daughters. And they also matter uh, for both when it comes to flourishing in school. Kids who are in single parent families are more likely to have trouble in school and in this case to drop out of, of high school. Now, there, there was a time probably about four or five years ago and I would just sort of stop right there. Um, but we are living in a society where we're seeing kind of you know, new family forms emerging, it seems almost by the year. Um, and the most common now alternative family um, is one that is, that is either formed um, initially by cohabitation or becomes a kind of transitional um, experience for many kids in the wake of their parents' divorce or breakup. And so what's happening now in our country is that kids are more likely to experience cohabitation, actually, than they are to experience their parents' divorce. Um, because about 21% of kids are born to cohabiting couples, um, and many more kids will experience cohabitation after their parents divorce or break up. Um, and this is, I think, um, cause for concern because it turns out, even though there are two adults in the picture, that the associations between cohabitation and child outcomes um, look a lot like the associations between single parenthood and child's outcomes. So things like drugs, um, dropping out, uh, depression, um, kids who are in cohabiting households um, are much more likely to have trouble with these kinds of outcomes um, from, you know, from acting out in school um, to, uh, to smoking pot as, as these studies touch on in one, uh, one way uh, or another. And I think probably most sobering um, in looking at sort of the outcomes for kids, 
is um, a recent report from the federal government issued in, in 2010, um, the fourth national incident study of child abuse and neglect. And what the study tells us basically, as we can see here, um, is that the, and this, I'm actually just taking the colors from the report, the original report, so it's just kind of, I don't know if it's, it's if, um, if it's accidental or providential, but what you can see here is the safest place for kids when it comes to physical abuse, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse is an intact biological married family. And that really any deviation from that, that structure, that family structure, um, is linked to more risk for kids. But the most dangerous place in America for our nation's children when it comes to physical, sexual, and emotional abuse is a cohabiting relationship where typically you have um, a mom and her unrelated male boyfriend in the household. That's here, here, and here. What you can see in this, you know, in this graph is that kids in that kind of household are about 10 times more likely to be physically, sexually, or emotionally abused compared to kids living with their married, married parents. So all these things you know, suggest, all these outcomes suggest that, you know, that marriage um, matters in connecting parents to their kids and that deviations from that, uh, from that norm you know, are, are consequential. Um, in important ways. And why is it that cohabitation, this newest kind of family form, is, um, is risky for kids? Well, one reason is because it necessarily offers, you know, less commitment. Um, there's less trust, there's less sexual fidelity, there's more violence, and there's less parental supportiveness um, in cohabiting relationships compared to married ones. And cohabiting relationships are much less stable um, than our married relationships. And if you've had kids, um, or if you work with kids, you know that they thrive on stability, on stable routines and stable caregivers. And cohabitation, unfortunately, often denies them of that, uh, that stability. So we have here a graph looking at the um, comparative stability of marriage versus uh, cohabitation for kids um, who, are, who are growing up to age five. You can see that kids who are born to cohabiting parents are about three times more likely to see mom and dad part ways by the time they turn five compared to kids born um, to married parents. So to kind of pull this in, in perspective, I think it's helpful for us to, to realize that um, there are scholars out there at places like Princeton and Brookings, as with this policy brief, who recognize that what's happening, um, at least in some ways they recognize, um, is not good for our nation's kids. And I'll read a quote here from Sarah McClanahan, my mentor at Princeton, Ron Haskins at Brookings, and Elizabeth Donahue, also from Princeton. They said, quote, although it was once possible to believe that the nation's high rates of cohabitation and non marital childbearing represented little more than lifestyle alternatives brought about by the freedom to pursue individual fulfillment, many analysts now believe that these individual choices can be damaging to the children who have no say in them and to the society that enables them. Before I conclude, I want to also say a few words about marriage and adults, because marriage matters not just for kids, but it matters for, for, for men and for women. And I want to be honest here, too. I think marriage matters more in some important respects, at least from kind of a vulgar sociological perspective, for men than it does for women. Um, that men who are unmarried, um, with some important exceptions, um, are more likely to have, uh, have trouble um, uh, than, than married men. And we know, for instance, on the health arena, that married men who get and stay married in their mid-20s, late-20s, early-30s, um, live about nine years longer um, than their unmarried peers or their peers who are divorced in midlife. And what this means in real terms is that the effect of marriage um, in men's lives from a health perspective is about as powerful in a positive direction um, as not smoking is, um, or, or I should say smoking is, in, in a negative direction. It's a pretty powerful effect. And given all the focus our culture has dedicated to um, you know, eradicating smoking from places like this, this club, I would suspect, um, and many restaurants <laughs> and other venues, um, you know, it's like we don't have the same kind of regard for marriage that we do for, you know, for not smoking. It's also the case, too, when it comes to the economic arena, that men especially, once again, are much more likely to work harder, smarter, um, and as a consequence, to earn more money um, after they get married. Um, about 18% more 
according to Robert Lerman at the Urban Institute, who's a really um, good economist at, at Urban, um, compared to their similarly credentialed peers who are not married. Um, and so, for instance, a colleague of mine at UVA, Liz Gorman, has found that men who are married are much more likely to only quit a job after they have a new job um, they found, whereas men who are not married are more likely just to quit a job um, and then go search uh, for a new job. So the point here simply is that something about uh, the institution of marriage makes men more prudent um, and hardworking when it comes to their approach to, um, to the, the professional sphere. And that both for women and for men, they tend to accrue um, you know, many more assets over the course of their lives um, that serve them well when they reach um, retirement um, compared to their single um, and, and divorced peers. It's important too, though, for me to, to acknowledge here that there are some outcomes where women seem to benefit more um, than men do from marriage. When it comes, for instance, to personal safety, um, sort of the effect sizes um, or, the, or the associations between marriage and personal safety are stronger for women than they are for men. Um, so one recent Department of Justice study found that women are much less likely to be, to be raped, to be robbed, or be murdered um, if they were married um, than if they were um, than if they were unmarried. So there are some outcomes here where the ladies, um, you know, have the bigger advantage. Now, in terms of thinking about this in a more kind of, you know, uh, sort of theoretical way, if you will, um, in terms of why it is that, you know, kind of on average, uh, men are more likely to benefit uh, from marriage uh, than women are. I, I think I would sort of say that there are sort of two things that come out in the literature. Um, one is that kind of men tend to embrace an, an ethic of responsibility um, in the wake of marriage. It's kind of socially um, sort of advanced or conditioned in them. And this was articulated well, I think, by George Akerlof, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist at Berkeley, also the husband of Janet um, Yellen, who's now the vice chair of the Fed. He said this, and he's not a conservative, he said this, he said, quote, men settle down when they get married. If they fail to get married, they fail to settle down. Um, and part of his idea here, of course, too, is it's not just sort of that there's a public ethic of responsibility around marriage. For men. It's also that marriage connects men to a, or connects a man to a woman who is going to kind of monitor his behavior and going to steer him clear, you know, of taverns late on Saturday nights and of motorcycle jaunts with his buddies, you know, on Saturday mornings. Um, so these kinds of, of influences from a loving wife are helpful to men's um, health and, and well-being. So let me just conclude here by saying that you know, given the clear economic, social, and emotional benefits of marriage for adults, for children, and for the nation, I think that we need to renew the economic, the legal, the civic, and the cultural foundations of marriage for our day. And in particular, for an audience like this, I think we need to challenge ourselves and our peers to publicly support the marriage mindset that guides so many of us in our own private lives, in our universities, in our businesses, in our schools, in our newspapers, in our political parties, and even our churches, we need to speak up on behalf of marriage and the truths, values, and habits that sustain a strong marriage culture. This is why I'm so proud of the work that the Agora Institute is doing around issues like marriage. When it comes to marriage, as with so many other issues, we need the information, the ideas, and the encouragement of groups like Agora to step up and speak up on behalf of the common good and the virtues that sustain that common good. The alternative, of course, is accepting a world where more and more of our fellow citizens and their children are divorced from the fundamental features of the good life, um, including marriage. And that, I would submit, is simply unacceptable for us for our fellow citizens, and for the success of the American experiment in ordered liberty. Thank you.